All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. This is the Microsoft Data Platform Continuity Virtual Group. This is the May of 2023 installment of our virtual group. I cannot believe it is May already. This year is absolutely flying by. Uh, with me today is a great, great resource in this community. He's a good friend of mine, longtime friend. Uh, this is High Availability Basics for the DBA, what SQL Server cannot do for you. And our presenter today is Edwin Sarmiento. And just, you cannot get enough of this information. This is this is fundamental to everything that being a DBA absolutely needs and requires. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Edwin. Dave, thank you so much for having me. Um, you know, I've we we I think we, you guys started this a couple of years back when it was still in the past and it has grown and uh, I love the opportunity and I you know I'm grateful for the opportunity to be able to share uh, mainly because a lot of the things that I'm going to be talking about here are things that we have been talking about for the past 20 30 years and they've never changed that's why I, I like going back to the basics because you can never go wrong with the basics. You can always think of, hey, what's new? Like the new fancy feature called contained availability groups in SQL Server 2022. But you can never go wrong with the basics. This presentation is all about higher availability basics for the DBA. You can replace that DBA thing with anything else. It still applies. But I also like, I, I, I like putting in a spin on this by saying, well, this is something that SQL Server cannot do for you. I actually did this presentation back in, if I'm not mistaken, 2021 for the uh, past uh, Data Community Summit. And it's interesting because again, uh, everything that I'm going to cover today is something that we have been dealing with ever since uh, we have appreciated how valuable high availability is. Now, I want to start off with, uh, Kind of a story. If you've been to my presentation, I love telling stories. Uh, a couple of months ago, I had to upgrade my phone, and buying smartphones in 2023 looks something like this. Either you're thinking about, am I going to get an iPhone, or am I going to get the Samsung phone? I used to be an iPhone user, uh, switched to uh, Samsung back in 2015 or 2016, never went back. But this is typically how we would buy smartphones nowadays is we look at any two of the most popular ones. We'll look at the iPhone, whatever iteration of the iPhone is currently. And then right now we have the Samsung S Galaxy S22. We do a quick comparison. We watch a ton of YouTube videos. We will look at tech sheets and reviews of any of these products that we're looking at, right? And most of the time, we're, we're going to be looking at something like this. You're looking at comparison between one versus the other. Yeah, I think it's iPhone 14. You're looking at the price, you know, Samsung is cheaper, and then your screen size, uh, your refresh rate. And most of the time, the, the decisions that we make are somehow influenced by this. Although, fun fact, sales is really all about emotions, and we justify with logic, right? What does this have to do with SQL Server and high availability or high availability in general? Because when we're deploying high availability solutions, specifically for SQL Server or Microsoft Data Platform uh, solutions or anything in general, what we most of the time spend our time, money, and resources doing is features. Let's take a step back and look at the most recent HA project that you've done. You did a POC, you looked at what features are available. And then you started testing, and then you started doing work in order for you to really uh, validate whether or not your assumptions are correct, right? But features have always been the central focus of this. Well, for one, we kind of, you know, gotten from Microsoft. Every time they're doing a presentation or they're running a conference or they're launching a new product or a new version of an existing product, this is what they really focus on. And when you look at the, uh, the features, the high availability features for SQL Server throughout the years, you can see the timelines. You know, back in 20, 2008, when they started introducing the concept of um, 
uh, stuff like backups and clustering, although a lot of these things have existed even before 2008. And then 2012, everybody was gung-ho about availability groups. I know I was. Available clustering that is now uh, stretched across multiple uh, data centers, geographic locations. And then 2004 is when the hybrid approach became a thing in SQL Server, where you can now have your backups streamed over to an Azure Blob storage. And then 2016 was when load balancing of read-only routing for availability groups was introduced. Then came 2017 when you can now run SQL Server on Linux. I'll admit I was one of the, I was so excited about this because now I can mix what I did before as an Oracle DBA now running SQL Server on Linux. Some people think this really isn't a high availability feature unless you're looking at containers on Kubernetes or, but this is really not an HA feature. The way I think of it is if people don't want to touch it because they're not sure how it would look like, it's high availability. Because most of the time, high availability issues are typically caused by people. Just say. And then you got like 2019 where you have stuff like Kubernetes and ADR and then 2022, what I mentioned earlier, stuff like contained AGs. If you look at the timeline, and if you go back to every version of SQL Server ever released, Microsoft has always been touting, this is the brand new feature, this is how it works. And, and that's one of the reasons why we as technical professionals have been kind of leaning towards what features are available. In fact, if you go through um, Serverfault, Stack Exchange, uh, Microsoft Learn, I think that's what it's called now, uh, and all of the public forums, people would always ask questions about blah, meaning, hey, I want to implement something like contained availability groups and I'm having issues with replicating this and that. And they start with, with, with a feature and how to use that feature. When they, they haven't even talked about what the real goal is, right? So before we even talk about these features, I know you're, you're kind of itching. So how do we go about this? Before we even talk about features, let's get back to the basics. Because the basics form the foundation of how and why we even choose any of the features that SQL Server makes available to us. And I'm not just even talking about features that SQL Server provides, even when you're choosing a storage platform. Like for instance, you're choosing between NetApp or pure storage, when you're choosing between hardware like Dell or HPE, you're choosing between network devices like, uh, uh, man, my mind's blanking. All I knew was Cisco, Cisco and Barracuda. And we have to go back to basics, right? So I want to take you to a definition from James Lutke Holter, and hopefully I pronounced his last name correctly from his book back in 2008, Pro SQL Server Disaster Recovery. His definition for high availability is this. It's the process of ensuring that systems remain available as long as possible, no matter what the cause might be for downtime. And I want to highlight a key phrase in this thing, as long as possible, right? Take that phrase and we'll carry it over throughout the conversation. Another definition from uh, Tech Target, from Ben Lutkovich. I don't really know why I'm picking people with last names I can barely pronounce. But his definition was high availability is the ability of a system to operate continuously without failing for a designated period of time. Again, highlighting a key phrase, designated period of time. There's a theme for this, right? Both of these definitions have common themes. And if you haven't figured it out now, by now, that's actually time. High availability is measured in reference to time. Why is that really important? Because now when you start looking at metrics that the industry has provided for us that we can take and run with, these are some of the metrics that are made available to us. 
when it comes to high availability. First is the percentage of uptime. This is something that we are very, very much familiar with. And this is where decision makers, the CXOs, whether that's the chief data officer, the chief information officer, the CTO, or even C C uh, CEO, this is what they're familiar with, very familiar with when it comes to high availability. It's the percentage of uptime. This is the percentage of time that a system is fully operational, typically measured in the number of nines. You got your two nines, three nines, four nines, five nines. The more nines you have, the more expensive it gets. I'm just saying, right? The more nines you have, the more complex it gets. The more nines you have, the more people you need in order to support it. But this is how it is being measured, percentage of uptime. Next is the MTTR, or the mean time to recovery. It is the average time it takes, or it will take, because it's not a question of if, it's a question of when, right? Failure is bound to happen no matter what. You might be thinking, we haven't had an outage in 15 years because we're running on AS400. So, yeah, but it's bound to happen. It's just a matter of when, right? MTTR is the average time it will take to recover or repair or restore a failed system, right? These definitions are great. These metrics are great, but you know what? Oh, there's another one, by the way. There's the mean time between failures or the MTBR. It's the predicted elapsed time between inherent failures of a mechanical or electronic system, or sometimes even hybrid nowadays, because now we got like, you know, on-premise and cloud during normal system operation. And I did mention earlier, I kind of have a problem with these metrics, especially as a consultant when I get brought in and it's a new project and either they're in the early stage of the planning process or they're doing POC in their, or they're in the process of doing a, a cutover to production with a new project, right? My problem with these metrics is how do you actually measure something when you don't even have anything? How do I measure percentage of up? How do I even measure nines? And I don't even have anything to measure. It's just like saying you're driving up to, um, I'm gonna use miles per hour for all my American friends. Um, if I'm driving at a maximum speed of 70, I've seen it, Pennsylvania, Ohio, 70, but I don't even have a car yet. So how do, I, how do I make sense of the maximum speed limit if, number one, I don't even have a driver's license, number two, I don't even have a car yet? And that's my biggest problem with a lot of the conversations around, hey, give me some uh, numbers when it comes to uh, you know, percentage of uptime, right? Especially when you're having conversations with decision makers. They're coming up with, I want this and I want that. I want three nines or four nines. How do I even give you anything like that if we don't have anything yet? And that's why I always go back to these. This is how we, or in my case, this is how I drive the conversation in the earlier stage of deploying high availability solutions. I start off with recovery point objective, simplifying the term, how much data can you afford to lose? The decision maker would always say zero downtime and zero data loss. In this case, zero. Okay, zero data loss. Until I start asking questions about uh, what's the typical business operation? Are they a nine to five shop or are they a nine to five shop, but they're operating across multiple time zones? These are the things that would drive the answer to how much data can you afford to lose? The second thing, of course, a typical example here is, let's say your recovery point objective of two hours, and that's what everybody agreed upon. The business stakeholders, the decision makers, and the IT team decided, okay, let's do a two-hour RPO. If you do the math, if something happened on, hopefully not while I'm doing this presentation, if something happened on 16th of May, 2023, 2 p.m., you have up to 12 noon to recover the data, meaning you're allowed to lose data two hours before the incident happened. Think of this as allowable data loss, meaning it is something that everybody agreed upon. 
Now, this is kind of kind of a hard sell to uh, customers. If you're a software as a service or a service provider, this is, this is kind of a hard sell to customers. And that's why you hear a lot of vendors talk about, no, there's no zero data loss, not to mention, you know, third-party vendor, vendors like Zerto or um, Veeam, again, not to uh, poke fun of how they're doing, what they're doing, but zero data loss is near impossible because of physics and statistics and probability. And so every time people would say, hey, I want zero data loss, you have to push back and start setting the right expectations. Worst case scenario, not best case scenario. Next, we'll look at another metric, recovery time objective or RTO. This answers the question, how much downtime can you afford? Or how long do you want your system to be down in case something happens? And again, typical decision maker response would be, I want zero downtime and zero data loss. Or in, in the manner that these metrics are presented, I want zero data loss and zero downtime. Well, okay. But we're looking at zero downtime, are you telling me your staff also needs to be zero down? Because nobody can work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, tell me more, right? These are metrics that drive conversation about what high availability should look like realistically. And this, of course, is more than just hardware, hardware failure. I did mention 24 by seven staffing. I did mention, hey, uh, you're, you're running off of different platforms coming from different vendors with different promises. So it's more than just hardware failure. Because a lot of people would think, okay, if you want HA, then our drives should be configured with RAID and we have redundant storage subsystems as well. And then we have redundant network uh, switches and network adapters and power supplies and, and um, PDUs. And it's more than just hardware failure because you have to think about, again, worst case scenario. So how would you deal with that? So using numbers again, if RTO, for instance, is two hours and everybody agreed on a two hour RTO, you kind of expected that if something happens at 2 p.m. while, well, a couple of minutes ago when I started this presentation, you are given two hours from 2 p.m., which means, well, you should get everything up and running by 4 p.m. Eastern, by the way, because I'm in Eastern time zone. But that, again, it's also setting the right expectations. If there's one thing in IT that I've learned that's applicable to just about anything, it's setting and managing expectations. And again, we're talking about high availability here, not disaster recovery. People sometimes confuse the two and assume that your recovery point and recovery time objective for HA is the same as recovery time and recovery point objective for DR. Uh -uh. They're not the same. Because physics. Yes, we are dealing with multi-data center deployments and multi-region, uh, sometimes multi-countries, multi-continent sometimes, and there's physics involved. So your definition of recovery point and recovery time objectives for HA, and like I said, we're talking about HA here, not DR. They should not be the same. Not be the same. Even the you know, giant tech companies have their own definition of if you're moving to the public cloud, this is what we're providing. It also depends on how deep your pockets are. The other metric that I sometimes throw in there is service level agreement. And it basically answers the question, what are we agreeing on? If I'm a service provider, let's say if I'm a software as a service provider and I'm promising my customers zero downtime and zero data loss, well, guess what? You now have to meet those expectations. 
I didn't say that your recovery point, recovery time objectives, and service level agreements yeah. are simply setting and managing expectations. Did your customers actually ask for zero downtime or zero data loss? Or is that your quote unquote USP or unique selling proposition? Is it something that they asked? Or is it something that you just wanted to provide? Or is it something that you just want to promise and never thought of delivering because you don't care, you just want to screw customers up, right? And it's these things, what are we agreeing on? As a service provider, what are you agreeing to provide to your customers? On the flip side, as a vendor, if you are a, or if a vendor comes in and they're providing you with third-party HA solution, or they're providing hardware, or they're providing something else, like Dell, for instance, if you're running on Dell servers or Lenovo servers, I don't even know why you want to do that. If you're running on HP or Fujitsu servers, what's their callback time if something goes wrong and your hardware needs to be replaced ASAP? What did you agree on? What did the contract that you signed say? Because that would impact your service level agreement to your customers, right? What was promised? What was promised to us and what did we promise someone else? I did mention IT is all about setting and managing expectations, right? These are metrics that I start with. These definitions are what I start with if a new project is, you know, they're, they're rolling out a new HA solution. We're on a you know project, they're in the middle of a POC and they're looking at how they can tweak, or if they already have something. Let's say they've already built a three node available cluster across multiple geographical locations and three replica availability groups. This is something that I would go back to. Why? Because number one, you might be agreeing something that you cannot really deliver realistically, right? And I haven't seen you this graph yet because when you're talking about RPO, RTO, and SLA, we cannot escape the fact that we need to talk about the big dollar dollar bills because it does require money. Uh, it took me a couple of iterations to come up with this graph. Uh, Brent Ozar and I had this conversation a couple of years ago about, no, that should be exponential. Because as you get closer and closer to zero, you know, the RPO, RTO, and SLA, closer and closer to zero, the more zeros you attach to your bank account, and more dollar values you need to associate with how to implement that. And that's also, again, it's also one of the reasons why you have to be realistic about these conversations. So when you know, decision makers start asking questions about, hey, how can you approach zero downtime and zero data loss? Well, other than asking questions to really identify what the recovery point, recovery time objectives and service level agreements are, the next conversation would be, well, how much can you afford? Not the downtime, not the amount of data, but how much can you afford? Because clearly, the cl again, you can look at this graph all you want. We're not just talking about SQL Server licensing and the hardware and maintenance and data center costs. You're talking about people that you need to provide to staff and the closer you get to zero, the higher the cost that is more expensive it becomes. And that's why I came up with what I call the three Ds of high availability. This is something that um, it's kind of like a guide, uh, a guide, and it's a uh, yeah, you can call it a guide. It's it's how I direct the conversations around high availability in order to make sure that you really are meeting your objectives, or if you're a consultant, you're meeting your customer's objectives, their goals, because I don't want people to get fixated on the how. Because you can, if you can achieve your goal without getting fixated on the how, the better. I want to focus on what the real goal is. I call us the three Ds because these are things that SQL Server cannot do for you. You have to step up and get your hands dirty to do this. Despite all the fear around chat GPT and AI and 
this is something that if you keep doing, will never be replaced by whatever type of AI. Because this requires not just critical thinking, but also lateral thinking and asking the right questions. ChatGPT will just provide you the answers. You're still providing the questions. The first D is all about the define or define. You have to be clear with what the business really needs. There's a difference between want and need, right? I want zero downtime, I want zero data loss. Is that really what you need? Because just like you know, buying a car, or I'll use the example I used earlier, just like buying a phone, everybody wants to, everybody wants to use or have the latest iPhone, or the latest Samsung, but how much of its functionality do you actually use every day? Most of the time, it's Instagram, TikTok, taking photos, instant messenger, and that's it, right? Because bar we barely use the phone nowadays. It's all going through either Zoom or IP phones. But again, start with what the business needs, not what they want. And this requires being clear about what it is they want. And mind you, while this is mostly on the data platform side or on the database side, as far as SQL Server is concerned, I don't stop with this. Because how good is a high availability SQL Server we spent a lot of you know, time, effort, resources, and by the way, licensing, building a multi-node cluster with multi-replica AG that's highly available when your app is not designed for high availability. I've seen so many cases like that where, yeah, we spent so much time, money, and effort, and okay, we paid Microsoft tons of dollars for licensing, not realizing that the app is not highly, uh, yeah, you just wasted all of your time when the app team didn't design their apps to be highly available. To start with what the business needs, right? We started looking at recovery point objective, your recovery time objective, and your SLS. You already have the definition. It's just a matter of asking the questions, right? What does the business really need? How, how much data can they afford to lose? And the pushback sometimes, especially for, with decision makers, is no, we really need data loss or, or zero data loss. Uh, really? Do you really need data loss or zero data loss? Sometimes it's a matter of asking questions in order to, gu in order to guide them properly. And what I tell um, technical professionals, DBA, sysadmins, or anybody involved in the tech team is it is not our responsibility to define these. It is not our, again, setting the expectations, it is not our responsibility as DBAs, sysadmins, network admins, anybody on the tech team, this is not our responsibility. This is the business stakeholders' responsibility, right? Financial industry, for instance, have certain restrictions about how much data you can afford to lose because otherwise you won't pass certain audit requirements or compliance requirements. So that's the business driving the decision on what these are. Healthcare has the same requirements. In order for you to meet certain audit and compliance requirements, we have to meet these. But that's not us. That's the business dictating what's required in order to operate as either a financial company or a healthcare company. So again, emphasizing the fact, this is not our responsibility. However, it is our responsibility to get the conversation going and have it put into writing. Because if you don't put it in writing, everybody expects, hey, you're supposed to be up at three o'clock in the morning because you're supposed to be doing on-call. And again, unless something is put on writing or in writing. I did mention a couple of times, IT is all about setting and managing expectations. And if we don't set expectations, somebody else will set the expectations for us. And now we're forced to meet those expectations, whether or not we're capable of them. Okay, It is our responsibility to drive the conversation, have something put in writing, and sometimes it takes years. From my experience, a lot of customers already have an HA solution that sometimes is causing issues. That's why they bring me in, not realizing they haven't even bothered asking the most important question. What are your objectives? Why do we have this HA in place? Right? So start with these. Right? Then you have to decide on your team's capabilities and skills. 
I find it really, really interesting when you know, a DBA team would deploy a multi-site cluster or distributed AG across different data centers and not having their entire team highly skilled. You know, maybe they were part of the operations team. They know a thing or two about SQL. Now they're responsible for attending to on-call duties. Well, if you do expect a highly available platform or high availability solution to be truly highly available, then you need to have highly capable team. It's just like saying, hey, I want to win the Formula One race, but I don't want my engineers to be Formula One level, right? They're not going to win any race. But that's the thing as well. What are they capable of? And the way I look at it is it's more than just being capable. It's a combination of both capable and available. Because what good is somebody who's available but is not capable? And again, I can get somebody fresh out of high school, give her the pager or the on-call duties, available 24 by 7. You know, you can pass around the on-call, but if they can't do the work, what's the point? On the flip side, how good is somebody like me who's more than capable but is sleeping because he's on the other side of the globe and doesn't even know that some issues are happening? So in order for you to really meet these objectives, you have to have a team. And I did say team because HA is not an individual sport. It is a team sport. You have to have a team who have members that are both capable and available. And of course, budget. Remember what I said earlier, the more nines you put into your percentage of uptime, the more you get close to zero downtime and zero data loss, the more expensive it becomes. I mean, think about that for a second. I'm sure you have a, you know, a VMware infrastructure right there and you're stuck all of your SQL Server instances in there. If they're all standalone instances, it's fine until you come up with a secondary replica where you now have to license the secondary replica by the CPU core. Whether that's through a, uh, SA or something else, you still have to license that. So now it's double the amount. Oh, by the way, you decide you want to do a third replica, now it's triple the amount of licensing cost. And we're not even talking about licensing for the monitoring tool, licensing for the operating system, licensing for everything else that you want to put in there. You need a budget. Plus maintaining that capable team and available team Got to need a budget for that, right? There's a cost associated with this, and I'm emphasizing how important having a team of people. Why? Because the biggest cost that you will ever have is not having a capable and skillful team. Somebody would say, hey, we have one person who's available and, uh, and skillful and really good at what he does. Well, until he burns out because he's been troubleshooting an outage for 16 hours and hasn't had any sleep yet, hasn't even gone to the bathroom. That's expensive, especially when the guy decides, hey, I'm, I'm out of here because I, you know, my health is more important to me than what I'm doing here. I'm, I'm bailing out. So you got to have budget for that, right? We need to understand the business. And you be very, very clear about the reasons why you want to implement an HA solution. Because I, again, I've, I've had conversations with CXOs, whether they're CEO, CIO, CTO, CDO, attending a, um, what's that? It was, you know, it was some Microsoft conference, or maybe they were at the, at the past data summit and they heard this thing called availability groups. Nowadays, it's Kubernetes. And they want to implement it because it's fun, it's exciting. It's, yeah, we can, we can talk about us moving to Kubernetes in, in you know, our uh, stakeholder report or stockholder reports. Again, is that really why you want to implement an HA solution? Because you need to go back to what the business really needs. And that's why we need to understand the business. Most of the time, DBA, sysadmins, and tech professionals don't want to you know, step outside of the realm of what they're doing. Like, I want to focus on tuning queries and making this thing highly available and not wanting to step outside of that realm and understand what the business actually does. 
sometimes when I ask DBAs and sysadmins about, hey, if this thing goes down, how much in dollar values is the business going to lose? And sometimes, oh, well, well, I'll, 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 uh, they're clueless. The only way for you to do that is to step outside of your realm of working with SQL Server, NHA, and technical work, and just talk to the business people. They will tell you. And now you're making decisions based on what the business really needs versus, hey, I'm now maintaining this mission-critical, highly available solution that's only available between 9 to 5. Easter. There's no point, right? Especially when it goes down at 3 o'clock in the morning and now you're woken up at 3 o'clock in the morning because you need to fix it, not realizing nobody's going to care at 3 o'clock in the morning because you're only operating between 9 to 5. That's the first D. The second D is decide. After you define what the business really needs, after you collected all of this information from talking to the business stakeholders, from talking to the people that matter. And again, if you're a software as a service company or providing services, you have to ask your customers. Don't assume. Because it's a, sometimes we assume, oh, they want zero downtime, zero dead loss. We're going to give it to them. No, we ask what they really need. What do they really care about? After you define what the business really needs, then you decide. Decide on what the best solution is. And I highlighted the keyword based on the definition. Sometimes we do things the other way around. Let's go AGs or FCIs. Oh, let's go to the cloud and build this massively large AKS and we'll dump everything. in. Defining has to come first. The problem needs to be clear first before we come up with a solution. Because otherwise, you have, you have a very expensive solution that is probably not solving anything other than creating more problems than it needs to. That's the worst part to be in. When something that you created, deployed, architected, and deployed in production that was meant to solve a problem is now causing more problems than it was intended to solve. Right? So you make those decisions like, for instance, what is the solution going to be? Companies are at the different stages in their life cycle or in their lifetime. A startup might not need an HA solution yet. And I say yet because as the business grows, there will be a need. So if it doesn't make sense for them to implement an HA solution based on the definition, then don't bother. If log shipping is more than enough, or backup copy restore is more than enough to a standby standalone instance. If that was more than enough, go figure. Not architect a massively complex seven node bail of a cluster with six replica AG because of that N plus one implementation across three different data centers and not having a 24 by seven staff to man it. What's the point? Decide on a solution, right? Schedule. You have a timeline. You have a, a date you put in where, yeah, we're going to be in production by this time. We have to make sure that we've, you know, considered everything. And sometimes it's it's all about taking the next step, which I'm going to be talking about later, right? And then budget. I'm not going to be taking that away from this slide because again, this is very very important. Sometimes your hands are tied that you cannot make something happen. Although in some, some cases as well, decision makers are trying to you know, tighten the belts and not give you the resources that you need because they think, oh, if we can get away with this, then maybe we can get away with something else in the future. My, my way of thinking with that is, well, you get what you pay for. So how do we address real HA needs if we're not gonna budget for it? Besides, this is an investment. Most of the time, people think it's a cost. No, it is an investment. And that's why I'm very clear about asking the question, how much is the business going to lose if, let's say, the entire stack, and I'm not just talking about SQL Server, the entire stack from the database layer to the middle tier, the integration to the app layer, the front end, how much is the business going to lose if this entire stack becomes unavailable 
in five hours or in three hours, then it becomes an, a conversation of investment versus cost, right? Skill set. Again, the team needs to have the proper skill set. And sometimes companies are in the buying because they will think, hey, we don't have the skill set. We'll hire an external consultant. Well, too bad, too bad. The external consultant only did the deployment once it went into production. His hands are tied now because that's the coverage of what the contract said. And now the people left. They're now responsible for managing something that, number one, they don't even know how it works. And number two, they don't even know how to deal with it. So you got to have the right skill set. And like I mentioned earlier, it's more than just becoming capable or it's more than just being capable. It's also being available. You got to have both. And then talking about in-source or outsource, I already mentioned about, hey, if you don't have an internal team who's capable of doing this, you might want to outsource. But you also have to make sure that you have internal teams who have the right skill set to take over whatever you know, a service provider or an external consultant did after they're no longer there. The way I approach this is if somebody brings me in and deploys an entire solution, I would bundle in the training because number one, I don't want to give them something that they cannot handle. That's the worst part to be in, is you now have to manage this massively large, massively complex architecture that you don't have any clue about. You didn't know how it was deployed and there's no documentation in place. So in my case, I would bundle them all together because you need people in order to make this happen. So whether that's also insourcing or outsourcing, because sometimes the managed services provider would provide support, but are they really capable? Talking about what I mentioned earlier about being capable and available. Sure, they're a 24 by 7 managed services provider because they built the entire stack. Now they're supporting it. Well, what was promised going back to the conversation on SLAs? Are they capable? If they're available, but it would take them four hours to finally resolve this, well, you just blew your RPO and or RTO, right? In the process, important definition or important decision about having processes in place. Sometimes just being clear on the process helps issue resolution fast, which I will talk about in a couple of slides more. And finally is the doing. So first we have the definition. Next, we have the decision. And you don't make decisions based on just about anything. You first have to define whatever the business needs and make decisions based on the definition. Now, once you have those two, you're now ready to take action because this is the only way to achieve results. And again, I've seen cases and I've seen customers where they would spend months doing POCs after POCs and after POCs. And I would tell them, look, if all you're going to be doing is POC, then, POC, then don't bother. You just wasted six months of your time doing a POC. You should have done this one month after you've started doing the POC, right? Because this is an opportunity that you're losing by not taking action. But then their, their, their typical response is, well, we don't know what's going to happen and we have to test all these. Well, you can't. There's only so much you can test, right? Put it out there and see what works. Now, I know for some people, it's a bit risky, especially in IT. Our job is to minimize the risk. And my response to that is, well, that's why you need to have capable staff, um, capable and available staff, clearly defined processes, Right, Because when you are already in production, you've deployed a solution, right? Again, have the plan based on what the definition is, you know, make the decision, implement the solution, and then you test it. But not to the point where you're testing everything and it's not going live into production, right? Again, you can only test so much. That's also why you need to have monitoring tools in place. I'm surprised at the amount of environments, the number of environments that I've worked with and still seeing in the field where they spent a ton of money on SQL Server licensing costs, hardware costs, everything, third party all these and not have a monitoring solution. And they're thinking, well, it's so expensive. Like, what, dude, you just spent X amount of hundreds and thousands of dollars on licensing costs and you're telling me monitoring is expensive? 
I mean, there's a reason why you, you know, you read on the news why Formula One cars have a ton of telemetry and they spend so much on monitoring the entire thing as the car is driving to the racetrack because they want to make sure that they're on top of everything. If something goes wrong, they can get notified even before something happens, right? Monitoring and having that operational procedure. Again, I kept emphasizing earlier about the availability and capability of the people, but you also have to create a process, a framework upon which that they need to operate on. Like, how would you go about your issue resolution and escalation? Is it just, you know, the monitoring tool sends alert, level one takes care of the alert and immediately forward it to level two without even looking at it? I've seen cases in the past where the operational staff or the operations engineers, level one people, don't know anything about this and they just automatically escalate to level two. The frustrating thing about this is they escalate to level two and they escalated, escalated it to the wrong team because they got so used to escalating that they don't even bother reading what the alert is about, what the source was, for, uh, was from, and they just escalate. Next thing you know, a five minute escalation turned into a four hour waiting because wait, uh, this is supposed to be escalated on, uh, to the DBA team, but it ended up to the storage team. And the storage team's like, well, why are we going to be dealing with this? It's not a storage thing, right? So you create operational procedures, like how you resolve issues. How do you escalate? I mean, you all, we want to meet the recovery time objective as much as possible, right? The longer we pass the ticket around, the longer it takes to address and meet the RTO. Excuse me. And of course, training is that. Notice how I've incorporated process and the people in, in, in all of these things. Because we keep forgetting once the solution is already in production, you got to have to write the process in place to make sure that we are indeed meeting those objectives your recovery point, recovery time, and SLA. If we're not meeting those objectives, then what's the point of going through all of these exercises and spending a lot of time, money, and resources deploying something if we're not meeting the objective? And this is part of how the teams need to be well aware of it. The, the most critical aspect of an HA solution is when people assume that I have nothing to do with this especially in, 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 uh, in SQL Server high availability when, I'll, again, I'll just use available groups as an example. In almost always every, well, let's say between 87% to about 93% of the, uh, I don't know why it was so precise, but in those types of environments, the minute that an availability group is in production, everybody assumes that it is the DBA's responsibility. Uh, no, it is everybody's responsibility. And what I mean by everybody, it is everybody who is responsible for anything that the availability group depends on. Now, it's the Active Directory's, uh, Active Directory Administrator's responsibility, because now your listener name is an Active Directory um, virtual computer object. It's the DNS Administrator's responsibility, because the listener name is also a DNS record. It's the network administrator's responsibility because your data replication and um, your IP addressing scheme and uh, the way those two replicas or multiple replicas talk to each other, they're responsible, you know, the network is responsible for that. I've seen cases where network administrators will just r roll out a firewall rule because it's part of a security compliance, not realizing that they're blocking the ports that SQL Server needs in order to send and receive transaction log records. Seen it happen, right? The storage admins need to be a part of this because, you know, if your database files are sitting on a storage area network, then they got to be a, a, a available for this. I remember uh, one of the cases that I worked with a couple of years ago where 
um, nobody realized that the virtual computer object associated with the AG listener name got deleted by a junior AD admin. They only found out when they did a, a, a patch installation on a weekend, installed the patch, and of course they wanted to reboot, started with a secondary, rebooted, and all of a sudden the reboot failed because there's nothing to authenticate to. The listener name no longer has an associated virtual computer object in Active Directory. Now that guy, whoever deleted that Active Directory uh, a virtual computer object might not be aware. Same as the network admin who decided, hey, we needed to deploy this firewall rule that suddenly blocked the ports that SQL Server needs in order to listen to uh, uh, AG replication traffic. That storage admin might not be aware that if they're updating the firmware, they're going to have a devastating impact on the databases that are now corrupt because of that firmware, firmware update. Again, I'm um, not talking from experience. No, I, it, again, it's, it's some of these things that I've seen out in the field where because people are not aware that now high availability needs to touch every single aspect. And this becomes a, a, a huge problem, especially in large organizations where teams are siloed. Like the network team need, uh, is not aware of what the DBAs are doing and the DBAs are not aware of what the sysadmins are doing and the sysadmins are not aware of what the storage teams are doing then all of a sudden somebody might decide, hey, we're doing this and not coordinate anything. I'm sure you may have your own horror stories about when somebody decides, hey, we want to update VMware because there's a, a critical hotfix and all of a sudden AG becomes unavailable for four hours because the hotfix failed and now we have to roll back and now the databases are down. Yes, they do happen. So you got to train the staff and make sure that they're both capable and available while also coordinating with all the different teams responsible for this. And this is a lot to take in as responsibilities for just the DBAs alone. Even if you know everything from top to bottom, AD, DNS, networking, storage, OS, VMs, and AGs. And even if you know everything, it's too much for one person to take care of. And that's why I said, HA is a team sport. You got to treat it like that. No individual wins championship games if you're playing as a, uh, in a team sport. It has to be the objective of every single team member, right? So in summary, instead of focusing on just you know the features, tech, uh, yeah, team, uh, Dave was saying team and full contact sport, especially when everybody disagrees or whatever, especially when, again, the... <sighs> I'm trying as much as possible not, not to talk about my recent client engagements. It's challenging when people start pinpointing or finger pointing and telling everybody, hey, it's, it's somebody else's fault, not mine. And uh, very recently, because I, I, I'm working with a client uh, in New York City and uh, application developers, we, and I say we because I used to be an application developer, um, from thin clients to uh, UI development, I suck at UI development, to web application development, backend, ASP.NET, and all that. And we never, and I say we, because most developers still don't, we don't think about HA. We don't, literally. And all we really care about is, hey, so long as it works. And then all of a sudden, it's the code that we wrote that is impacting availability. Especially when the code that you wrote, or I wrote back in the days, happens to cause such a huge memory leak. Now it has taken, it froze the entire app. At the end of the day, again, at the end of the day, if you're buying stuff on Amazon and all of a sudden the page is not responding, you don't say, oh, the database has a problem or the UI has a problem. All you care about is the site's down. And perception is key. And that's why I keep highlighting it is a team sport. Everybody needs to be a part of this in order for you to meet those, recovery, those objectives, recovery point, recovery time, as well as your service level agreement. That's why, like I said, I like going back to the basics. Because the basics keep us 
really zoomed into what the real objectives are. I'd like to open up the floor for questions about the presentation. By the way, that's my contact information, my blog, my LinkedIn profile, my Twitter handle, and my email. Do you have any questions? That is fantastic. Thank you very, very much. If anybody has any questions, either just throw them in the chat window or just quite literally come off mute and uh, you know, bring your questions. Um, and I can point blank tell you that these are the kind of things that nobody really talks about. And everybody walks into an HA architecture going, I want to use this feature or that feature. And I, mean, I just two weeks ago, we pulled an availability group out of a customer environment and went back to just bone stock. Uh, and it was because they found out that after we had put it in, after they had told me their RPO and OTR, I can't speak today, the RPO and RTO, they realized that they didn't need to be that strict and they didn't need the added complexity. So after a while, they realized that it was hurting them and not helping them. And I helped them roll them back and they're quite happy. I wish those stories were uncommon, but they're not. I know. In most cases, an availability architecture creates more downtime at the end of a year than it's than it prevented. And if that's the case, then you did something wrong in the process. Exactly. And again, it's not the tech, it's the people, it's the practices, it's the operational management of the solution. And you know, usually it's not the wrong solution. Usually it's just managed poorly. You know, but you got to identify what you need going into it. Because if you don't, you're just grasping at straws. And even the, the comments about the RPO and RTO, how many times have you asked a customer, hey, what are your RPO and RTO? And you just get deer in the headlights stares. Often, it's too often. Most of the time, those things are not defined. So the unwritten expectation is zero data loss and immediate recoverability. Doesn't work like that. <laughs> I mm -hmm. wish it did. And, and it's interesting because we are uh, in, in the days of DevOps and I don't know if I'm muted. Okay. Uh, in the days of DevOps and you know how you can incorporate your database and data platforms into the de DevOps practice, we start to see new definitions, like for instance, SLO, the service level objective. Well, for one, it's just a redefinition of what we just talked about. But in the context of operations, like what are we trying to achieve in the first place? That's why it's, it's, it's an objective, right? Because in, an, in a high availability solution, if you don't define your recovery point, nor your recovery time objectives, nor your SLAs, then there's no point in even talking about the service level objective. Because what goal are we trying to, you know, what goal are we trying to achieve here? It's just like saying, hey, I, I'm driving too fast. Well, how fast is fast if you don't have a maximum speed limit? That's just fun. <laughs> Especially with a, with a, you know, a $400 ticket. Well, it depends on which state you are. Exactly. Yeah. There are some states where it's a $5 pay on site fee for uh, excessive fuel consumption. Read anybody in Montana. Enjoy. <laughs> 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 yeah, feel free to use your chat window if you have any questions yeah. and if you're watching this on videos uh, on youtube uh post your questions on the comment section as well perfect either post on the comment section or you've got edwin's contact info directly up there and you or you can hit us from the meetup page and quite frankly if you have questions let all of us know because a lot of times a very good, innocent question can actually turn into a new presentation. I just finished writing one on Azure storage performance tuning because I got a lot of repetitive questions about how to make this or that faster or what options do you have? And it led to a full hour presentation and I had a lot of fun with it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So like I could go all day. I had to keep it to a minimum to fit it into an hour. <laughs> awesome. Well, hey, I don't think we're going to get any questions. If you're watching this on YouTube, please do not hesitate. Reach out to Edwin, reach out to us, drop it in the comments or the, you know, a lot of the comments on the YouTube channel, however you want to do it. And we'll make sure to see that and we'll get your questions answered. 
So Edwin, thank you, thank you, thank you. We really appreciate it. And for everybody that's watching this, either live or recorded, thank you for attending and we will see you next month.